You Quranist hadith rejecting p- people can't even answer one simple question. We Ahlu Sunnah wa Jama'a, we know that the Prophet recited in seven or ten different ways. Which one is the right way? <laughs> Which one do you use? <laughs> and why? <laughs> How do you pray? Where's Mecca? Well, actually, the answer is very simple. You yourself, Ahlus Sunnah wa Jama'ah, you don't know what recitation the Prophet actually used because the Hijazi dialect, the dialect that the Prophet primarily spoke in, is actually extinct. Nobody actually uses it anymore. And we're going to show you by your own sources that you guys ran into a lot of issues when it came down to the recitation of the Quran. And you had to manage and do a lot of things in order for people to understand what is being said and what to do and what not to do. It wasn't coming from the Prophet because the Prophet didn't experience these issues necessarily. But the thing is, you guys incorporated a whole different letter. You added a whole different letter to the mix that the Prophet himself wouldn't have used. And to tell me about the seven or the ten different modes or whatever nonsense you guys want to say well we're about to dispel that notion because you guys just say a lot of things that you cannot prove but you know what i love i love these western orientalists those bad people that you guys don't like to talk about that look at the history in a way where it's not biased for them obviously there's going to be islamophobes and people that are looking in regards to just trying to destroy the message but then there's other people who are honest and you know pretty sincere in the way they pursue their information. And they've uncovered a lot of things in regards to the lies that you guys keep spewing to the people just so that you could defend your tradition that has no basis in the Quran, that has no basis in history. And all you want to do is defend those people that wrote said books and say that this is what the Prophet said. But in truth, in reality, you're just accepting what the dude in the mosque is telling you. But you yourself didn't go out and explore to see if what they were telling you was actually true. Now to introduce this specific Arabic letter that Sunnis like to brush under the rug and pretend like it existed during the time of the Prophet or the Prophet used it in his recitation, there's a good interview that my brother Tehran and my sister Roxanne from the channel Skeps Islamica, they did where they interviewed Dr. Marion Van Putin. Dr. Van Putin is a professor or assistant professor who has been a doctor for more than a decade. His field of focus is linguistics. He also spent a lot of time in the transmission and the history of the Quranic text and he's very well versed in the linguistics history of Arabic and other languages. So he would be someone who's very well fit in regards to introducing to you this letter and also telling you some of his discoveries which many others actually said very similar things. How do we know there was no Hamza and that mm. it was added later? And what mm-hmm. does that mean for the unbroken oral tradition? Um, mm-hmm. Just imagining mm-hmm. that there was no Hamza in the Arabic language for me was mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a really interesting question. Uh, it's once again a nice example where where really looking at different reading traditions gives a different perspective. But how do we do this? So so let's first talk about you know for for for, for listeners along what is a Hamza? Hamza is what we in English call a glottal stop. Uh, it's the, as in glottal. Um, and it's in the word mu'min, for example, or bi'r, or um, shay' at the end, or sama'. And um, if you look at what the grammarians tell us about, about the Hijazi dialect, they tell us time and time again, the Hijazis had no hamza, uh, unlike the Nejtis, or unlike others who did have it. What's that? What's that, brother? So instead of saying mu'min, um, the Hijazi said mu'min, and instead of bi'r, they said bir, and or instead of you know uh, yasalu, they said yasal. And that fact is reflected in the orthography, and this is something that we've noticed for a long time. When you write mu'min, you don't write um, you write mim wal mim nun. And that's an unusual spelling because we, if we look at pre-Islamic Arabic, and this is where this comes into play. What letter do they use to write Hamza? They use the Elif. So a word like Mu'min, you'd expect it to be written Mim, Elif, Mim, Nun, if it was really pronounced Mu'min. So it looks like it is writing Mu'min, uh, but the reading traditions, some of them at least, read it as Mu'min. And so just, just going by the orthography, you already go like, well, it's clearly at least intended to write a dialect that doesn't have Hamza. But just because it's using an orthography that is meant for something that doesn't have Hamza, does it mean the language of the Quranic composition that doesn't have Hamza? And um, so that's kind of those are two different things, right? Spelling can be different from pronunciation. 
So how do you show that the what the orthography, so the spelling seems to show that that is actually what the language of the Quran does? Well, to get at that, you have to start looking at rhyme. And what you will see in rhyme, there's not many places. There's like four or five, maybe a bit more of words where if you drop the Hamza, the rhyme works better. This is in Surah 55, I think, where Sha'an rhymes with um, together Viban, which works much better if it rhymes as Sha'an, Sha'an together Viban, right? Mm. And uh, that's exactly what you'd expect. That's what the spelling seems to suggest. And there's a couple of other cases like this where you can kind of play around with these with these different options where every time you look, the, the, the rhyme works better without the Hamza. So that really suggests that the rhyme seems to suggest that what the orthography is uh, representing is indeed what is in the language. Now, this is pervasive idea. Well, but the Quran obviously had Hamza because, you know, we open up a Quran and there's Hamza in there. It's very important to note that the letter that we know as Hamza did not exist at the time and had no way of writing it. Um, so, you know, it really had to be added, which is why you still write it as a while, but you write a little Hamza on top or you, you write Elif with a little Hamza on top. Uh, it's an extra sign, a sign that gets invented in maybe the second or third century Hijri. Um, we don't really know when it happens. The earliest texts that we have have it except for the Quran. And so, uh, so this, and indeed, um, you know, Hafs has a very conservative pronunciation of the Hamza in his, in his recitation. Although not in all places. There's one place he drops the Hamza where most other readers keep it, which is in, um, Kufuwan. That's in Surat al-Ikhlas. You will probably have learned to recite it as Kufuwan, but it's Kufuan in most other uh, recitations, uh, actually all of them. Uh, so Kufuan is unique to Hafs. So not even the other transmitter of Asim, uh, Shoba, reads Kufuan. He reads Kufuan too. So this is a very nice example where, you know, even, even when we take all the rules and, and, and talk about the standard, there's a place where, the, you know, Hafs is not behaving like standard classical Arabic. But of course, because we all assume that this is the standard, we think, well, that's a normal form. But when you think about it, it's a very strange form. Um, what kind of noun would that be? What kind of noun ends in U? Um, those don't exist in, in, in Arabic. Uh, there are words that end in U uh, with a Hamza. And so those do exist. So, but then if you start looking at other reading traditions, you'll see, you know, Warsh reads Mu'min. He doesn't read Mu'min. Um, uh, Abu Jafar reads Mu'min doesn't read Mu'min. Uh, Abu Amr has as an option to read Mu'min and can also read Mu'min, depends on what he feels like, basically. So those forms exist, and no single canonical reading tradition has no Hamza at all. Um, but there's a good chance that there were reading traditions around. Now, that brings me to the second part of your question that you had. What does that mean for the unbroken oral tradition? Um, yeah, what does it? What does that mean for the unbroken oral tradition? That's an interesting question and, and a difficult question. Um, although I think the, the Islamic tradition is very kind of robust against uh, an attack, if we want to call it that, from this direction. Because if we think about it, um, these things don't matter, right? A mu'min and a mu'min are the same thing. Uh, that's that, not very important. So linguistically, I mean, I get excited about Hamza's. But I can totally understand that people are like, well, why is this guy so excited about Hamza's? I love watching Dr. Van Putin. He's someone who's very well mannered and he's very well presented and he's very well educated. And every time he says a comment where you guys don't like what he said, you guys just jump at his throat and attack him. But he told you nicely there that there could be some issues with the oral traditions. I won't be very nice. The oral tradition is just full of nonsense. It's just horse manure. It's just things that you made up and you try to force down people's throat and try to pretend that it's an actual authority. For you to keep passing by and passing off this cult-like mentality that you keep trying to enforce people on it. And if they don't follow what you're saying and these rules that you guys keep making up, then this person is an apostate and this person cannot be a Muslim. So all of the nonsense that you guys keep trying to pretend that you know what recitation the prophet said or the, the recitations that the prophet used, this is just complete lies. Because the truth of the matter is not only that the Hamza did not exist in the Hijazi dialect, but your sun letters and moon letters is not something that also existed in the Hijazi dialect. So you guys like to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, where you're connecting the words together and you're dropping the alif phonetically in Bismillah, right? But actually, what the history shows that the Hijazi dialect they did not have this sila or these connections. So it would have been Bism 
Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. So this would have been the style or the main recitation that the Prophet would have used because this is what his people were using. This is what his people were saying. And as God says in the Quran that every time he sends a messenger, it's in the tongue of the people that are being warned. So the Prophet would have used the primary tongue that his people would have understand. So there's no Hamza and then there's no Sila. Now where does that leave with your seven recitations? Five of which actually came from Persians? Well, it keeps them exactly where the Bukhari book and all the other Persians that wrote these hadith books that you like to shove down our throats in the garbage because they have no basis in the message nor does it have a basis in the preservation of the Quran because God himself clearly said that he's preserving the dhikr, the remembrance. So the text itself is preserved but your style of recitation and what you want to do in recitations and what to say and what not to say this is all just mumbo jumbo that you guys came up with because which recitation which would have been the primary recitations that not does not have any Hamza because Wash the more the main recitation and then Hafs and Asim is also the other main recitation which one overtook the other in history they both have a bunch of Hamzas in it so you could see clearly that there's places where you know some people say Hamza and some people don't but for you you don't even realize that it's not seven or ten so your hadith about seven or ten recitations or seven huruf or seven modes it's not true because there's a lot more than seven or ten recitations. There's well over 14 different recitations where you guys had to sit there and standardize it. When did these recitations appear? Two to three centuries after the Hijrah, after the Prophet. When did your Hadith books appear? Two to three centuries after the Prophet. So hey, there's something that's happening where the same nonsense that we find in Hadith, we're finding it in what you guys are saying about the recitations. But that's not the funny part is. When people standardized, okay remember this word, when people standardized the recitation okay a century after that some dude a scholar came by and said you know what these are the seven primary recitation so it took two to three centuries and another century after that for the dude to appear and tell you like hey this is what the truth is it's just the same thing as Ibn Kathir when the person who sat there and spent his whole life about the exegesis and he had all these chains leading back to the prophet on what the actual exegesis of every verse is but yet they're all contradictory and then he goes well no that one the truth. Well, what can we do without Ibn Kathir? What can we do with this scholar that's going to tell you which seven recitations is the truth? What are we going to do with without Al Albani who's going to tell you which truth is what, what is the truth and what isn't? In the time of Uthman radiallahu an, when he had laid out a kind of template for the Quran, it was a consonantal kind of template which, because of not having vowels, could be read if you try to read it. Let's say you could read it in a different way. Like if I, like let's say today, text message language, WT would be what, but it could be wit, it could be wet. Now people would normally know if I said what you doing, they you know they wouldn't think wit or wet you doing. But if somebody who wasn't maybe privy, they could start reading it differently. And then people are sometimes inheriting these varied uh, uh, readings by people. And certain people are choosing, they're kind of like saying, well, I'm adopting this part from this person, this part from this person. And they then get quite popular with it. So Nafi as an example and Asim as an example, Asim ibn Abi Najud and different people, Hamza and Kasai, these kind of these several, but let's say seven who become really popular, they choose, they end up becoming the kind of the vocal piece for a particular select reading. Uh, is this what we're, uh, this is what we're saying? Yeah, Dr. Right. So. Mm -hmm. right. so you guys, your history is actually full of lies. The concept of the Qira'at is something that actually has baffled many Islamic scholars because they understand there's a lot of lies and there's a lot of twisting that happens in regards to these recitations. Now I'll give you more proof on how the Hamza didn't exist. Let's go to these letters that start with the Quran, like Alif, Lam, Mim, all right? Ha, Mim, Ya, Sin. Oh, am I saying something wrong? Letter Ya is the last Arabic letter. Ya. Ya. Well, that's the thing. In classical Arabic and the Arabic that introduced the Hamza, the letters themselves, when you're pronouncing them, they don't say Ya. They say Ya. Uh. They don't say Ha. They say Ha. Uh. Letter Ha. And you can see in all the recitations, they don't say Ha. Mim. They don't say Ya. Seen, they say ya seen ha mim kaf ha ya ain sod. It's supposed to be kaf ha ya 
عين صاد ها 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 So this is showing you that the actual recitation that the Prophet used did not incorporate the Hamza at all. Which single recitation is the truth? None of them. None of the recitations that you guys have provided for us are actually reflective of what the Prophet said. But this is what's beautiful about the Quran and the preservation of the Quran. For me, it's the actual text that is what matters. And these little discrepancies that you have, is he the owner of the day of judgment or is he the king of the day of judgment? Well, it goes back to the exact same root. And from the root of the word, which is malaka, it could mean king, it could mean owner, but it's the exact same understanding. It's the exact same remembrance. But this is a problem that you guys cannot do in your recitations because sometimes we like to say, صراط المستقيم right اهدنا صراط المستقيم so me as an arabic speaker when i hear the word صراط i understand what is being said because god said that this is a clear arabic language this is a clear arabic language so the root words and how the arabic is dictating itself is something that's very important but one of your recitations he likes to say صراط المستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم حسبي الله عليك حسبي الله عليك وهذا الحمل والكراك بعد منكم صحيح له So can you please explain to me what Zirat al-Mustaqim is? Because the word Zirat has no meaning in Arabic. And the root word of Zirat, Zarata, does not really have a basis in Arabic to mean anything in regards to the straight path. So you guys have had a problem. And that problem was the expansion of the Islamic State. And when the Islamic State started to expand into areas where Arabic was not the primary language, just like in Persia. And where, where people were introduced with different dialects to this Quran, they all started to put their little input in regards on how to say the text that is written in front of them. And as time went on, and as the years went past, your Hijazi dialect, it went extinct. And this is what you guys don't understand. It's very simple. The Prophet's cousin, Ibn Abbas, his recitation of Sa'ala Sa'il Bi'adhabin Waqir, the Hamza did not exist for the Hijazi speaker, the Hijazi tongue. But that recitation did not make the cut. So when you're going to ask me which recitation is right, it's actually the text is what's right. And I can understand what God is telling me from the text itself, the context. It's not about how I'm going to recite it. Because for you, what is important is the recitation and for you to say every letter and you get 10 reward, 10 cookies for every time you say a letter. But this is not what the Quran was about. The Quran was about the context and it's how it's affecting you as a human being. So you're asking me a very stupid question when you're telling me which of the sevens or 10 lies that you want to attribute to the Prophet is the truth. Because to me, I don't play those games. For me, the word is very clear and the word is telling me that there is no deity except God and do not take any ally nor do I take any helpers without God. So now that leaves you in a little pickle. In regards to your little tajweed rules, the rules that appeared, you know, in the third century after the hijrah, where you guys claim that the Prophet wants us to elongate the alif before al hamza But if you want to read the Quran better, like it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then keep watching. The second option is the real option. Basically, secondary med is a long vowel, so alif, waw, or ya, followed by a hamza. If that long vowel and the hamza are found in the same word, we call it a connected med, med mutasil. And this med gets five harakat. What's that? What's that, brother? So in the word sama, we're supposed to say sama. Depending on the word and its position, there's some alifs that we need to elongate. But now I need you to provide me evidence on where the Prophet is telling me that I need to stretch and elongate the alif if there's a hamza present in the word after it. Because if that's not there, then you guys are, what's the word that you guys left? Bid'ah. 
Ahlul Bid'a wal Jama'a. That's what we've been calling you for a very long time. So, which recitation do I use? Actually, a few mix of them for me to understand the Word of God. Not to sit there and to recite it to you like a parrot and for you to hear it like a parrot and do absolutely nothing with it and make fun of the people who say that the Book of God is enough. So checkmate again. Which recitation do you use? Ehdina Zirat al Mustaqim, right? Wow. So this part is for my brothers and sisters who are genuinely interested in seeing how I approach the different recitations and different readings in the Qur'an to extract the most compatible or the best understanding that I can get from the Qur'an. A good example is in chapter 5 verse 6 in regards to the washing before the prayer. So if I pull up the verse now in the most common way that we see it in modern time. So here this verse which is chapter 5 verse 6. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَىٰ O oh, those who believed, if you if you stand for the prayer, So wash. So remember, we're washing our faces and our hands to the elbows. And wipe your heads. And then it says, And it says, And your feet to the ankles. Now, the problem here, a lot of people think that your arjulukum is about wiping. So it says, Wipe within your head and then wipe your feet. But if you look at the diacritic that is being presented in the way that it's being recited, وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ Here there is something that's called the fatha. This diacritic on top of the last letter of the actual word is a fatha, okay? Which is now being reflected because of the wa. Wa is reflecting it off where it's supposed to fit in its in its uh, position in the grammar, right? It's reflective of actually اخسلو, which is wash. So wash your faces and your hands to the elbows and wash your feet because it's arjulakum to the ankles wash your feet to the ankles but i don't believe that this is the actual uh proper recitations after also seeing what my brother musa had to present in regards to this and i will show you why because there is another recitation that is just literally changing this diacritic from arjulakum to arjulikum. This is from Shaba and Asim. And now you could see that in that recitation, the only difference is now it's saying wa arjulikum. And now that we put like something that's pulling it down, it's being reflected biruusikum. Wamsihu biruusikum wa arjulikum. Now it's wash your face, wash your hands to the elbows, wipe your head, and wipe your feet to the ankles. Now for me, this is what is proper and correct. One, because of practicality. So if I was in the desert where there's a lot of dirt and dust around me, if I introduce water to said dust and, and dirt, it becomes mud. And therefore now I went opposite, where in regards to trying to clean myself, I now I am muddied myself. And if I go into the mosque with these said feet that are wet, that have mud on them now, I'm going to also soil the place. And you can clearly see that nowadays the people that are always constantly washing it three times because they think that that's what the Prophet told them to do. There is a bad order in certain places in the mosque because people just walk in their wet feet. There is not a place or a, or a facility for you to dry your feet technically. Your shoes start to get a bad stench if you're wearing shoes. Your socks starts to get wet. So it's not very practical in washing your feet. But you could also deduce this from the verse itself. So here in this verse, in the style with this arjulikum here, God is telling us to wash our faces and to wash our hands. And then he's telling us to wipe our heads and to wipe our feet. And then later in the verse, God is saying, فَلَمْ تَجِدُوا مَاءً فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا فَامْسَحُوا بِوُجُوهِكُمْ وَأَيْدِيكُمْ مِنْهُ And if you do not find water, then exfoliate, a good exfoliation. So wipe your face and your hands from it. The things were slowly getting demoted. So anything that was supposed to be washed got demoted to wiping, and anything that got that was supposed to be wiped, it got demoted to nothing. So this is how you can extract information from the Quran in regards to which proper approach should we take with these different recitations. God has already answered these issues. So whatever you differentiate in, you take the whole Qur'an, you take exactly what's being presented to you, and you obey God. God showed you that your feet get muddy when you put water on them. So it makes more sense to wipe them than to wash them. It's very simple. <laughs> Alright guys, peace.